Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being a part of this service, either online or in person on all three campuses. We wa I want to welcome all of you. I want to remind everybody that Tuesday is the national election, also state election, also local election. Tuesday is election day. Some of you, like Kathy and I, have already voted ahead of time, but others of you have not yet voted. You're waiting for Tuesday. And here's what I want to say to you. Please, 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 please vote. It is our civic duty. It is our responsibility. It's our opportunity. We live in a democracy where you can express yourself. You, you can vote. You can elect your leaders. And you've got to do that. Every war we've ever fought, everything we've ever been through is to give that freedom along with other freedoms to the citizens of this country. And if you have already uh, registered to vote, you got to vote. You have to vote. It's so important. So take a look at the candidates. Think about it, pray about it, ask God about it, and vote on Tuesday. The next thing I want to say is today... We began our Spanish ministry at Richmond Rosenberg campus. It is fantastic. Yay. And we're so excited about it. We're so pumped about it. But you know, the Spanish ministry at Richmond Rosenberg is like a new church start. It's a new church plant. We're not sending hundreds of people there that are in the Spanish service. It's just a handful of people. And we've been working over the last couple of years trying to get in our, our lives and touches into the Spanish community. And now we get the opportunity to launch. Pastor Juan Carlos Heredia is just the most amazing guy. He's brilliant. He is absolutely brilliant. And he is so gifted, so talented. He loves people. And he is going to be the live preacher. We don't have dead preachers. We have live preachers uh, at the Spanish service. So it's, we're pretty excited about that and what's going to happen there. We, we don't know what to expect. It may start slowly. It's what most new church plants do and then grows with time. But we know that God is going to give us an, a, the opportunity to touch a group of people that we were not touching, not reaching, who do not know Jesus to come and receive Christ as their Savior and grow and mature. So we're pretty excited. I'm going to ask us to pray on all our campuses. Let's stop for just a moment and pray for Pastor Juan Carlos and for this great ministry and his team. Father, we come to you and we say thank you for the opportunity that you have given to us to reach a group of people we were not reaching, a group of people that have not been reached. And we pray, Father, that you would touch, bless, open hearts, open doors. And Father, that we would see this ministry just explode, that we would see so many come to know Christ as Savior and those who do know Jesus to grow and mature in their faith. And I pray that you would bless Juan Carlos and Bless, bless all of the Hispanic team and use all of them to be a shining light in Richmond Rosenberg and to see you move. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. I look out at the crowd at the Sugar Land campus. This is our first week of small groups, and it is for all the campuses. I'm pretty excited looking out and seeing this crowd. But even with that, we're still social distance. We still have a few empty in front and behind us. We're still being very careful with masks and all that kind of stuff. And yet, there's still room, and we want to encourage. If you are home today and you'd like to come back to be in person, we would love for you to come and join us with that. It's been COVID year, and in this COVID year, there have been a lot of businesses that have been touched, and maybe none more deeply touched than have the airline industry. And I'm really praying and hoping that that'll turn around for them because so many people are employed by the airline industry, and they're so important to our country. There was a guy that did get a ticket, and uh, he slept in, and he was going to be late. He was scared to death he'd miss his flight, so he rushed and went as fast as he could go. And when he got to the airport, he decided that the fastest way to check in his bags that had to be checked in was with the external baggage handlers, not inside through waiting in line with that, but the baggage handlers on the outside. So he went up to the baggage handler, and, and he said, this is very important. you got to go really fast. But the guy wasn't going fast enough. 
to suit this guy at least. And, and he began to be abusive. I mean, just yelling at him and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't making him move any faster, but he just kept going. And then when finally he got all done, the guy took off, went inside, off he went. Well, the next guy that was behind him went up to the baggage handler and said, sir, I am so sorry. That guy was so rude to you. I couldn't believe the things that guy was saying. And the baggage handler just smiled and said, it's not a problem. I've already gotten back. And he said, what what do you mean you already gotten back? He said, well, he's going to Chicago, but his bags are going to Japan. And here's what I want to say to you. You go back to the, you get a ticket, you use the external or internal baggage handler, you treat them very, very nice. Very, very nice. Well, what about you? Has somebody mistreated you? Has somebody hurt you, wounded you? And how have you responded to that? Have you gotten back? And and what if this is a relationship that has gone bad and it just keeps going bad? What if it is a long time issue for you? What if it that you have a bad that just won't turn around? Well, that is what I want to talk to you about today. We've been going through the book of James, and we're back in this last series in James, in James chapter 5. And you got to see the passage we're going to look at today in context with what we looked at last week. In in James chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, we looked at last week, there were rich people that were abusing impoverished people. You were either rich or you were impoverished in first century. But now when we come to verse 7 to 12, it's like James was telling these rich people, this is what's going to happen to you. But he now turns to those who are the, the mistreated, and now he speaks to the mistreated. And he talks to them about what do you do when you are in a situation that just doesn't turn around, doesn't, doesn't become good. You are in a bad that just keeps going. Now, he talks about this issue. Maybe it's relationships, maybe it's not, but you are going through hard times and it seems like it just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps coming. What do you do then? Well, notice then what James says in James chapter five, beginning in verse seven, be patient. Therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, behold, the farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient with it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, that you yourselves be not judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience. Now stop for just a moment. See, this whole passage is about suffering and patience. Maybe it's suffering in the hands of a negative relationship that just keeps going south. Or it is the suffering over circumstances that you're going through and nothing seems to work. Whichever one it is, he is talking about suffering and patience. He says, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we count those blessed who endured. You've heard of the endurance of Job, and you've seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. All of us go through hard times. All of us have relationships that we are frustrating and things go bad and then things get good and then things go bad and things get good and things go bad and things get good. This is is life. But what happens when the second part doesn't happen? Things go bad and things go bad and things go bad and things go badder, which isn't a word and I know that, but I'm trying to make a point. It just gets worse and worse. And the bad just keeps coming. What do you do? How do you know if you're in that kind of a situation? Well, James actually says there are three ingredients to the bad that just won't get better. So you judge for yourself. For instance, when the situation is out of your personal control, it may very well be that it's one of these moments in your life. It is like 
a farmer. This is what James says. Look at what he says in, in verse five. Uh, verse seven, be patient, therefore, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Behold the farmer. He's the first example. Waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. I'm not a farmer, and I don't think that surprises anybody that knows me. But I know a lot of farmers. I've had conversations with a lot of farmers. In my very first pastorate while I was in college, it was a little country church and almost everybody that came was farmers. And I, I got the opportunity to spend time with these guys and sit on the porch with them and just talk and yak. And, and one of the things that I discovered is that one of the greatest struggles that, that farmers have is so much of what they do is dependent not on themselves, on other things they can't control. I mean, if they, if they don't have rain for a couple of weeks, they got irrigation and that's fine. But if, if they have a drought, they'll never have enough irrigation and they're going to lose their crop. Bugs are always coming every year and they know it and they've got insecticides. But what if there is an infestation? They cannot control that and they will lose their crop. What if there's hail? What if a tornado comes? What, what if there's a flood? There's so much about their life they can't control. And, and James is using that idea. There are things about our life we cannot control. No, no matter how good of a problem solver you may be, you can't solve this one. And are you in the midst of that? You're a great fixer-upper, but you cannot fix this. You cannot change this. And the bad just gets better. There's another thing he uses, another example of an, an ingredient, and, and that is simply when people around us won't take personal responsibility. We all have people around us that don't take personal responsibility. We're not robots. We are responsible. We, we aren't puppets on a string. I've never liked the theology, I don't think it's true scripture, I've never liked the theology that sort of suggests that we're all pre-programmed and now we're just living out our programming. That is not what I read in scripture. Every single one of us are responsible, we're held responsible before a holy God. But every one of us have experienced individuals who say this, it's my life. I'll do what I want to do with my life. I will act the way I want to act with my life. I am, it is my life. And it's true. And there's sometimes that teenagers come to this place of rebellion against their parents. It's my life. I'll do what I want to do. But the problem with all of that is that no one lives on an island. We are interconnected with other people. All of us are. And even though it is my life, my life touches other people's lives. It, it, we can't help it. And what happens is, is that sometimes maybe teenagers or, or young adults, I, it's my life, I'll do what I want to do and I'll go the direction I want to go. Yes, you will and yes, you can. But what happens is, is that there are people that love you, their parents or other people who love you and they are intertwined in your life and they have no control over what you will do. And there is such pain and such wound that happens and they're dragged along. Or maybe it's reversed. Uh, 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 not that long ago, I was talking to a, a, a woman in our church, and, and she, she was saying that, look, when she was seven, her parents made two terrible decisions, two horrible decisions. And all of her life, she fell as been changed because of it, wounded because of it. She's gone through all the things she's gone through. And she still feels the pain of all of that. You see, parents, it's, you got, you're, you're carrying along other people too, your kids and others along with you. The truth is all of us are intertwined in the lives of other people and even though it's our life, we impact the lives of other people. And, and James is using that idea when he talks about the prophets in verse 10. As an example, brethren of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Here is what he's trying to say. 
The, the people of God had uh, people of God had gone bad. They had turned their heart from God, and these prophets, God would raise them up, and they would preach, and they would weep, they would cry, they would yell, they would scream, they would do anything they could do to turn people's hearts around, and they would not change. And so when the judgment of God came, it didn't just come on the people, it even came on the prophets, not God judging the prophets because these people, but the prophets were there, they were a part of it, and they felt the same pain as everybody else. And James is saying, look, you and I, when we're making decisions, we are pulling other people along with us, and the pain we earn for ourselves, or maybe someone earns for them, they drag us along with them. And maybe you are going through a pain because somebody else is irresponsible. Somebody else is doing the wrong things and you cannot turn them around. And now you are going through the pain along with them. The third illustration he uses is that when, that when the problems that keep coming seem to have no explanation or reason, no rhyme or reason, it just comes. What did I do? I, can, I, I don't think I did anything. And yet I am in the midst of pain and struggle and it will not quit. And he uses the illustration of Job in verse 11. Behold, we count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job. Now, you know the story of Job in the Old Testament. You've probably read this, this book maybe multiple times. The book of Job is suspected to be the oldest book in the Old Testament. And if it is, it's the oldest book in the Bible. Whether or not it is or it's not, I'm not sure, but it's suspected to be the oldest. And here is the story. There is this guy, and he's living for God, and he's not doing wrong things. He's doing right things, and, but there is something going on behind the scenes he knows nothing about. And he's going through hard times, a bad that won't stop. And I mean a bad that won't stop. And as you're reading the first couple of chapters, you're just, man, your heart goes out to this guy. But then in the midsection of the book, good grief, you are so frustrated. You can hardly stand it because one so-called friend after another, so-called friend after another, well, you wouldn't be going through all these problems if you weren't bad. And so we just think you're so bad and terrible. And he just has to stand up to it because one after another, after another, after another accuses him and puts him down and berates him. Man, you got to feel sorry for this guy. So what about you? Are you, you going through things right now? You don't feel like there's any reason or rationale to this, any rhyme or reason. That you didn't do anything. You, you've gone to God. Oh, God, just show me if I did something wrong. God's not showing you anything. And there is this deep sense of frustration that you have. I don't understand this. And this is what James is sort of painting. How do I know that I'm in a bad that won't get good? It just doesn't seem to get good. It's when, when it is something beyond my control, when it involves somebody else who's pretty mean, pretty bad, pretty irresponsible, and I'm, being, I'm getting sucked in because of my relationship with this individual. They're sucking me into all the problems or when there is something happening in my life that there's no rhyme or reason. So when these moments come, what do you do? How do you handle this moment in your life when it just is so bad and it won't get better? Well, now James answers that question. And he says, first of all, be patient. I've never been a fan of patience. I've never really wanted to do it. Didn't really fully appreciate it. Be patient. But listen to what he says. James chapter 5 verse 8. You to be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. That word that is translated patience really comes from two Greek words. Makro M-A-K-R-O, makro, which means long or far. And thumos, T-H-U-M-A-S, thumos or O-S, T-H-U-M-O-S, anger. And what the idea is when you bring the two words together is have a long temper. Be long tempered. That's the idea of patience. It means that you don't give in to the temptation of anger. 
want to be angry. I want to be angry, but I choose not to be angry. It is long tempered and it is a decision not to quit because when you are in a situation that's just the bad, that's not going to get any better. There's just a sense of I'm just quitting. I can't take this anymore. I'm just quitting. And God is saying, no, don't give ground to the temptation of being angry. Don't give ground to the temptation of quitting. Instead, be patient. So why should you, why should I be patient? Well, first of all, because he says God is actually in control. And notice what he says. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Now, part, part, hear the word part. Part of what he is referencing here is Jesus is coming back soon. Every person in first century believed that Jesus was coming back in the first century. Every person in the second century believed that Jesus was coming back in the second century. Every person, every Christian, a Christ follower in the 21st century is to believe that Jesus is coming back in the 21st century. He is coming back soon. Because what happens to us when we spend every day believing this could be the day. And quite honestly, it could be. Quite honestly, with everything that's going on, it could be. When we live every day as though this is the last day, it does something to us. It keeps us pure hearted. It keeps us ready for the coming of Christ. Part of what he's talking about is the soon return of Jesus Christ. But there is another part of this that what he's talking about is God sees and God's coming to your rescue. There, he's right at the door. The Lord is coming. He's right at the door. God is going to come to your rescue in the here and now. May not be the return of Jesus, but God is coming to your rescue. That's what he's talking about. God's delay does not mean denial. God has a timing. Be patient because God is, is going to deal with this situation in his timing. And he does have time. He has perfect timing. Would you just maybe calm down, stop being as nervous, take a deep breath, and understand that God's going to deal with this. God sees, God hears. And he's coming to your rescue. You can be patient when you know, even though it's out of your hands, it's not out of his. Second of all, you can be patient because God rewards our patience. See what he says, Job 5, 11, behold, we count those blessed who endured. He is talking about Job. Behold, we, behold, we count those blessed blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job, and you've seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and, and is merciful. Look, when you are reading the book of Job, I know at the first, boy, you are just, wow, I didn't realize this is behind the scenes and what's going on. And then you get to the midsection and you're thinking this midsection is never going to end. It is one person after another, after another, after another, who are just slaying Job. But don't quit, because when you get to the end of the book of Job, you're stunned by what happens. In the second half of Job's life, he was more blessed than the first. God doubled everything he had. It pays to be patient. That is the story of Job. It pays to be patient in God because God is a righteous, holy God, and he will deliver you. What happens to us when we go through hard times and difficulties is that we learn and grow ourselves. It builds our character. It deepens our life. It toughens you up emotionally, spiritually. It toughens you up mentally. You and I need this. The worst thing that could possibly happen is every time we turn around, somebody is rescuing us too soon, prematurely from the fire, because we need to go through these times. It's part of what grows us and matures us and makes us better and stronger and wiser. 
And God is allowing you to be better and stronger and wiser and more mature and all of that. And so he is giving you the times to go through the hard moments of your life to grow you. There's a reward for patience. There's a reward for patience. You become stronger than you ever dreamed you would be. And then there's a third thing. Be, we, can, we need to be patient because God is at work in this situation right now. Not just he is coming back or one day he's going to meet this. He is already at work in your life. Notice what he says in verse 11. Behold, we count those blessed who endured, who have heard of the endurance of Job, and we have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings that the Lord is, present tense, is full of compassion and is merciful. Not someday, will be, it is now. God is. And God is for you. He is. God is at work in your life. And just because you can't see what he's doing doesn't mean he's doing nothing. He is at work behind the scenes in your life and the life of other people that are involved in all of this. He is at work, and you've got to trust that he is. If you could somehow pull the curtain aside, you would see the work of God, the hand of God in your life. There was a man and his daughter who were out in the woods going on a nature trip and, you know, out in the woods and stuff, and they came across a cocoon and there was the caterpillar. He was trying to, to squeeze through. He was trying to go through that metamorphosis. He was trying to get through. And he was obviously, when they looked at him, got down there and looked at him, it's obvious he was going through suffering. It was obviously that he was struggling, struggling, and could, couldn't seem to make any progress. And out of compassion, the little girl just quickly went, went, bent down and broke open the cocoon to free the caterpillar. And he died. She had no idea that would be the result. He died. See, the little girl did not realize what was actually happening. That in order for this caterpillar to turn into this butterfly, he had to go through the struggle and in fact, I've read that the depth, if you see a butterfly that is just beautiful, it's just the, the colors are so deep and striking, the depth of the color of the butterfly's wings tells you the depth of the struggle it went through. The greater the struggle, the more beautiful but the butterfly. You see, it needs the struggle. And so do you and I. <laughs> this is what we struggle with, with God about. Why aren't you rescuing me from everything so fast? Why are you taking so long? Because we're blessed with the struggle. We need the struggle. And it's why it's wrong to, to get every kid out of every struggle they go through. They need to struggle. You can't rescue them all the time. It, you're hurting them. You're not helping. They're not blessing them. Let them go through struggle. It is part of growing up. We need it. He says, be patient. Second of all, allow, he said, your heart to be strengthened. See verse, verse 8? You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. That phrase, strengthen your hearts. The Williams translation says, put iron in your heart. It was about 30, 35 years ago that I came across the Williams translation of this verse, and I was stunned by it. Put iron in your heart. It stuck with me. And what God has done in my life, every time I've gone through such deep struggle in my heart, there have been times in which, whether it was true or not, there have been times in which I felt like I'd put my family on my back and I was carrying my family through this moment of struggle. There have been times in which I felt like I've put this church on my back and I've been carrying this church through times of struggle. And when those moments have come in my life, I could hear God whisper in my ear, put iron in your heart, Mark. Put iron in your heart. 
God never says, try to be strong. You notice that? It never says that in the Bible. It says, be strong. Be strong. To try to be strong is wimpy because you can be strong if you want. He says, be strong. So what does strong look like? Well, first of all, it looks like I am waiting with expectation. I know God's going to come through and I'm waiting with expectation and that's part of my strength. There was a, 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 a little town that was going through a drought and, and uh, I mean, it was just months. They hadn't had any rain. And finally, the pastors who were all friends of each other called, called uh, came together and said, let's just call all of the church of Christ, Jesus Christ in this, in this town, all the denomination. Let's bring them together. Let's have a big prayer service uh, on a Sunday afternoon. So they did it. And boy, it almost it seemed like everybody in town came. Everybody's motivated. And they said to them, bring an object of your faith when you come, when some people brought their Bibles and some brought crosses and other things. And uh, unbelievable, why should it be unbelievable? It was amazing, about 30 minutes into the prayer service, all of a sudden, it started raining. I mean, it was a downpour, it seemed to come out of nowhere. Just pouring down, raining, everybody got wet, people were standing out, loving getting wet. But everybody got wet, but one little girl, six years of age, because her object of faith was an umbrella. <laughs> she was the only one that didn't get wet. She brought an umbrella. She was sure God was going to answer that prayer soon. When we are expecting God to move, we are really being strong. Psalm 130 verse 5 says, I wait expectantly trusting God to help for he has promised. Second of all, we're being strong when we're not blaming others. Not blaming others. Notice what he says in verse nine, do not complain brethren against one another that you yourselves be not judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. He sees and he hears. Why in the world would people, why would he say this? It doesn't even look like that verse fits in this. Somebody else over there is mistreating us, and what do we do? We start blaming each other. But I got to tell you, when a family starts having problems, what do they do? They start blaming each other. Well, we, we wouldn't be in this situation if it wouldn't be for the dumb thing you did. And churches blame each other. Well, we got to figure out who, is, who has screwed up here and begin to blame and criticize each other. He says, when you're going through trials, stop this. Stop blaming other people. Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 26 says, it is good to wait quietly. Wait quietly. Would you just be quiet? Wait quietly. Stop all the complaining, the grumbling, the griping, and trying to put blame on somebody else. Would you be just quiet? And you will see the salvation of God. And here's the last thing. We're being strong when we are waiting confidently. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. It was around 35 years ago. I don't know exactly the number of years, but it would have been close to that. And I was going through such hard times. I was going through such a difficult moment in my life. And when I was praying and I was saying, God, please show me what to do. Please give me a, a promise I can claim. He took me to Isaiah chapter 30, verse 15. Honestly, folks, I had read Isaiah. I've read the whole Bible many times through. But you know how you're reading the Bible and you don't really read it? I mean, you're reading it. But it doesn't do anything until you have to have it. And then it's like it jumps up and grabs hold of you by the throat and throws you to the ground. And all of a sudden, for the first time, you really, 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 really see it. And that's what happened with this verse. And I was just amazed by it. And I began to claim it's not just this verse, the whole passage passage, began to claim it in my life. And I, the best I knew how to do, started obeying that passage of scripture in my life. And I saw God move in my heart, move in my life. But the first part of the passage in Isaiah 30, verse 15, in quietness and confidence will be your strength. When you are in the middle of all kinds of problems, stop yakking. 
Stop complaining, stop grumbling, just get quiet and get confident in God. Stop being so nervous, stop being so anxious, stop taking matters in your own hands. Psalm 37 verse 7 says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently on him to act because he will. After all this time, he has never let you down. He's never forgotten you. He has always been there. He is always taking you through. And he'll take you through again. Just calm down. Take a deep breath. And trust him. Now, where are you? Where are you in all this? Maybe it's somebody, maybe it's some situation, but this is the moment that God is saying to you, I want you to learn how to trust me. So would you do it? This is the morning I want to encourage you. Would you give your heart to Christ? Accept him into your heart? Would you join this church if you already know Jesus is your Savior and maybe you, you have been visiting Sugar Creek either online or in person? This is the day. Would you join this church today? Would you recommit your heart to Christ today? Let this be the day that you settle some issues between you and God. So let's pray. Father, we come to you today and we acknowledge, oh God, we need you. We ask, Father, that you would move among us and be our God. And Lord, if it's somebody, help us to forgive and just go on. Just let it go. Yeah, but as soon as I let it go, he'll, he'll do it or she'll do that thing again. It's okay. Because, God, our eyes on, are on you and we're trusting you. You're already at work and we're going to act like we know that. If it's a situation, Father, move in our heart that we would take this situation and hand it to you and trust you and stop all the complaining, all the griping. Just get quiet and trust you. Now, Father, I pray you would move in people's hearts online, in, in, in person, on three campuses, and that there would be many who come to know Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior today. Join this church today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.